Welcome back to Flipping Pages, Stirring Sauces. Oh, I thought that when one of my subscribers, and I, I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all the people who have liked and shared. When one of my subscribers asked me to read this book, The Making of a Slave by Willie Lynch, I thought that it was going to be an easy and simple task. After all, it's a very small, very thin book. And so I thought it was going to be an easy task. And I don't normally make notes um, this time. I made a few notes. And by no means is this a easy read. Um, I first would like to say though, everything, the melanated man, and when I say man, I mean male and female, have been taught about our history has been a lie, a complete and utter lie. And we need to unlearn all of that. When Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, there were already melanated people here. As a matter of fact, the entire earth was populated by melanated people, by the Creator Himself. And the Creator assigned different sections of this planet to different members of the 12 tribes. And so that song they taught us about Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue and discovering the Americas, you can't discover something that belongs to somebody else that was discovered thousands of years before you came on the scene. The only place that the melanated man didn't occupy was the Caucasus Mountains. And that is where our oppressors originated. And the only reason they were able to capture us and take us into captivity was because of the gun. And with the gun, our oppressors are very powerful, but without it, they didn't stand a chance against us. And I'm going to present this book for educational purposes because you see in my family we have five generations alive in some cases four and in all those generations it has been the norm for us to get married and raise a family and some of the women in my family I have my mother and an aunt who married the same man and spent their entire lives with that one man I have an aunt another aunt who didn't marry all the men she's been involved with.
but the one that she did marry, they stayed together until he died. So in my family, my mom had three other siblings and they were also married. So, yeah, my mom and her three siblings were married and I happen to have 11, well, 10 siblings and with the exception of two of those siblings, we've all been married, some of us more than once, and raised families, and that has been the norm. But I've come to the understanding that in the greater melanated society, that might not be the case. I also know for a fact that the male members of my family are providers. Not only are they providers, well, with the exception of one, but not only are they financial providers, they are physically present in their children's lives. And some of them, when the women in their lives try to cut them out of their children's lives, they stood up in front of the judge and said, this is what I'm paying in child support. And no judge had to tell me to do that because I had an example. And that example was my father. Every one of his children bears his name. And he supported them, all of them. And so what is the norm in my family is not apparently the norm out there in society. Um, melanated men are accused of running away from their fatherly responsibilities. And there are some melanated women out there who look down on the melanated man. Now in my family, in every generation, there are some of us who have married outside of the melanated race. But it was never an issue because that has happened in every generation for the past five generations. And our parents were not the type of people to say, oh, I don't want you involved with that person because there are different race or because they're different this or no. Our parents position was always the final decision is yours and if somebody made us happy then they were happy for us they believed in marriage and they supported marriage they believed in the family unit and they support that family unit and I've had discussions with my mother where she has proudly exclaimed that my father is the only man who has known her in the biblical sense. And I'm proud of her for that because that was a very good example that she set for us. Although some of us didn't follow that example, but the example was there for us to follow. And in presenting this book, it caused me to look at um, society, the melanated society on a wide scale. And to comply with Canadian and American 
copyright laws. This book, The Making of a Slave, is being presented under the fair use section of the Copyright Act for educational and research purposes. Um, I guess under the Canadian part of it is fair dealing. Um, no. What is going on in our society today is in direct correlation with what is written in this book and what has been going on for close to 600 years. the melanated woman has been brainwashed into believing that the melanated man cannot protect her or provide for her and that she cannot trust him and that she cannot respect him and I say to you that the devil is a liar and the devil is in the mix. And the melanated woman can rely on the melanated man for support. The melanated woman can respect the melanated man. And the melanated man can respect the melanated woman. And the melanated man and the melanated woman can have a happy home and raise happy children in a happy melanated home. I will now begin. This speech was delivered by Willie Lynch on the bank of the James River in the colony of Virginia in 1712. Lynch was a British slave owner in the West Indies. He was invited to the colony of Virginia in 1712 to teach his methods to slave owners there. The term lynching is derived from his last name. Greetings, gentlemen. I agree to here on the bank of the James River in the year of our Lord, 1712. First, I shall thank you, the gentlemen of the colony of Virginia, for bringing me here. I am here to help you solve some of your problems with slaves. Your invitation reached me on my modest plantation in the West Indies where I have experimented with some of the newest and still the oldest methods of control of slaves. Ancient Rome would, be, would envy us if my program is implemented. Why did Willie Lynch mention ancient Rome? I will tell you. Willie Lynch mentioned ancient Rome because he was aware. He was aware of the fact that they rewrote our history. He was aware that they forced a false savior on us. He was aware that our language had been changed. He was aware of who we really are. He was aware that they changed our names, our culture, and our spirituality. We were beaten and killed into submitting to their fake God and into idol worship. 
you know, idol worship became widespread among us and is alive and well today. The person they refer to as Jesus did not bear the burden for the house of Israel. The person they refer to as Jesus, Yahushua, or as some people say, Yeshua was a messenger, a messenger sent by the Creator to the house of Israel to deliver a message. And nowhere does he ever say to worship him. He said you must worship the Lord your God in spirit and in truth, which leads me to tell you that while there is some truth in the New Testament, the majority of it is a lie made up by our oppressors because they knew that one day we would wake up and they want us to take it easy on them when we once again become the head and not the tail. So they tell us to love our enemies. What does our Creator say? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what our Creator says. And our Creator Yep. The person who bore the burden for the house of Israel was Ezekiel. Ezekiel bore the burden for the house of Israel. And if you read Ezekiel chapter 5, Ezekiel chapter 4, and you can read chapter 5 as well. You will see that Ezekiel bore the burden for the house of Israel. But they would have us believe that some person by the name of Jesus was hung on a cross for our sins. Come on. The Creator says, I change not. I am the same today, tomorrow, and forever. And he tells us in the Torah that thou shall not kill. So if the Creator is commanding us not to kill, why would he require a man to be murdered in such a brutal way? Why would he require a man to be lynched for our sins? That's a brutal way to die. Why would the Creator require that of us? Or of anyone? Some food for thought. Anyway, I will continue. That is why Willie Lynch mentioned ancient Rome because the Romans changed everything and gave us a false god so that we would worship idolatry instead of the Creator. As our boat sailed south on the James River, named for our illustrious king, whose version of the Bible we cherish. I will read that again. As our boat sailed south on the James River, whose version
sailed south on the James River, named off after our illustrious king, whose version of the Bible we cherish. It's a powerful statement right there. It is very well known that King James changed the Bible to suit his own purposes. Why is Willie Lynch mentioning his version of the Bible? It's very telling right there, isn't it? He's mentioning their version. And I wrote the question here. Why did Willie Lynch specifically mention King James and his version of the Bible that they cherish? I will continue. <sighs> I saw enough to know that your problem is not unique. While Rome used cords of wood as crosses, for standing human bodies along its highways in great numbers. You're here using the tree and the rope on occasions. Do you know whose bodies were hung on crosses along their highways? These were the bodies of our ancestors, our melanated ancestors, who refused to accept the false religion that was being forced on us. That's who those bodies were, our ancestors, who stood up, stood up for the spirituality that was given to us by the Creator and handed down verbally. I caught the whiff of a dead slave hanging from a tree a couple of miles back. You're not only losing valuable stock by hangings, you're having uprisings. Slaves are running away. Your crops are sometimes left in the fields too long for maximum profit. You suffer occasional fires. Your animals are killed. Gentlemen, you know what your problems are? I do not need to elaborate. I am not here to enumerate your problem. I am here to introduce you to a method of solving them. In my bag here, I have a foolproof method for controlling your black slaves. I guarantee every one of you that if installed correctly, it will control the slaves for at least 300 years. My method is simple. Any member of your family or your overseer can use it. I have outlined a number of differences among the slaves, and I take these differences and make them bigger. I use fear, distrust, and envy for control purposes. These methods have worked on my modest plantation in the West Indies, and it will work throughout the South. Take this simple little list of differences and think about them. On top of my list is H. But it's there only because it starts with an A. The second is color or shade. There's intelligence, size, sex, sizes of plantations, status of plantations, attitude of owners. Whether the slaves live in the valley, on a hill, East, west, north, south, have fine hair, coarse hair, or is tall or short, now that you have a list of differences, I shall give you an outline of action. 
But before that, I shall assure you that distrust is stronger than trust and envy, stronger than adulation, respect, or admiration. The black slaves, after receiving this indoctrination, shall carry on and will become self-refueling and self-generating for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. Don't forget, you must pitch the old black male versus the young black male and the young black male against the old black male. You must use the dark-skinned slaves versus the light-skinned slaves and the light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. You must use the female versus the male and the male versus the female. You must also have your white servants and overseers distrust all blacks. But it is necessary that your slaves trust and depend on us. They must love, respect, and trust only us. Gentlemen, these kits are your keys to control. Use them. Have your wives and children use them. Never miss an opportunity. If used intensely for one year, the slaves themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. Thank you, gentlemen. No. We still talk about high color black people. Just last week, I heard these words come from one of, come from the mouth of a sister and I was flabbergasted. See, we were forced and beaten into believing that dark skin is ugly and many dark skinned people still believes this today. I've ended friendships because of self-hate. I've ended friendships because I've heard people say, oh, I wish I was lighter. Oh, I'm too dark. Why didn't my mother marry a light-skinned man? I got sick and tired of the self-hate and I ended a very good friendship as a result of that. We were taught to trust only our white masters and to love them. And at the same time, we were taught to hate ourselves. Melanated people, we are beautiful people. And we should love every melanated inch of ourselves. If we don't know how to love ourselves, how can we love others? How can you be full of self-hate and love others? That just doesn't make any sense. By the Black Arcade Liberation Library, it was the interest and business of slaveholders to study human nature. The topic of this is, let's make a slave. By the Black Arcade Liberation Library, it was the interest and business of slaveholders to study human nature and the slave nature in particular with a view to practical results. I and many of them attained astonishing proficiency in this direction. They had to deal not with earth, wood, and stone, but with men, and by every regard they had for their own safety and prosperity, they needed to know the material on which they were to work. Conscious of the injustice and wrong they were every hour perpetu perpetuating and knowing what they themselves would do, were they the victims of such wrongs? They constantly looking for the first signs of the dreaded retribution. 
They watched, therefore, with skills, skilled and practiced eyes, and learned to read with great accuracy the state of mind and heart of the slave through his sable face. Unusual sobriety, apparent abstractions, sullenness and indifference, indeed, any mood out of the common was afforded ground for suspicion and inquiry. Frederick Douglass. Let's Make a Slave is a study of the scientific process of man-breaking and slave-making. It describes the rational and results of the Anglo-Saxons idea and methods of ensuring the master-slave relationship. The original and development of a social being called the Negro. Let us make a slave. What do we need? First of all, we need a black nigger man, a pregnant nigger woman, and her baby nigger boy. Second, we will use the same basic principle that we use in breaking a horse, combined with some more sustaining factors. What we do with horses is that we break them from one form of life to another. That is, we reduce them from their natural state in nature, whereas nature provides them with the natural capacity to take care of their offspring, we break that natural string of independence from them and thereby create a dependency status so that we may be able to get from them useful production for our business and pleasure. Cardinal Principles of Making a Negro For fear that our future generations may not understand the principles of breaking both of the beasts together, the nigger and the horse, we understand that short-range planning economics results in periodic economic chaos, so that to avoid turmoil in the economy, it requires us to have breadth and depth in long-range, comprehensive planning, articulating both skill, sharp perceptions. We lay down the following principles for long-range, comprehensive economic planning. Both horse and niggers is no good to the economy in the wild or natural state. Both must be broken and tied together for orderly production. For orderly future, special and particular attention must be paid to the female and the youngest offspring. Both must be crossbred to produce a variety and division of labor. Both must be taught to respond to a peculiar new language psychological and physical instruction of containment. And I made a note here. We were crossbred in order to water us down so that they could control us because in our natural state and in our natural environment, pure, in our pure state. There were no match for us. So, psychological and physical instruction of containment must be created for both. So you see, they're comparing us to a horse, liking us to a horse. We hold the six cardinal principles as truth to be self-evident. Based upon the following, the disclosure concerning the economics of breaking and tying the horse and the nigger together, all inclusive of the six principles laid down about. 
Accordingly, both a wild horse and a wild or nature nigger are dangerous even if captured, for they will have the tendency to seek their customary freedom, and in doing so might kill you in your sleep. Damn right about that. You cannot rest. They sleep while you are awake and are awake while you are asleep. They are dangerous near the family house, and it requires too much labor to watch them away from the house. Above all, you cannot get them to work in this natural state. Hence, both the horse and the nigger must be broken. That is, breaking them from one form of mental life to another. Keep the body, take the mind. In other words, break the will to resist. Now, the breaking process is the same for both the horse and the nigger, only slightly varying in degrees. But as we said before, there is an art in long-range economic planning. You must keep your eye and your thoughts on the female and the offspring of the horse and the nigger. A brief disclosure in offspring development which will shed light on the key to the sound economic principles. Pay little attention to the generation of original breaking, but concentrate on future generation. Therefore, if you break the female mother, she will break the offspring in its early years of development, and when the offspring is old enough to work, she will deliver it up to you for her normal female protective tendencies will have been lost in the original breaking process. For example, take the case of the wild stud horse, a female horse and an already infant horse, and compare the breaking process with two captured nigger males in their natural state. A pregnant nigger woman with her infant offspring. Take the stud horse, break him for limited containment. Completely break the female horse until she becomes very gentle whereas you or anybody can ride her in her comfort. Breed the mare and the stud until you have the desired offspring. Then you can turn the stud to freedom until you need him again. Train the female horse whereby she will eat out of your hand and she will in turn train the infant horse to eat out of your hand also. When it comes to breaking the uncivilized nigger, use the same process but vary the degree and step up the pressure so as to do a complete reversal of the mind. Take the meanest and most relentless and most restless nigger. Strip him of his clothes in front of the remaining male niggers, the female and the nigger infant. Tar and feather him. Tie each leg to a different horse, faced in opposite directions. Set him afire and beat both horses to pull him apart in front of the remaining nigger. The next step is to take a bull whip and beat the remaining nigger male to the point of death in front of the female and the infant. Don't kill him, but put the fear of God in him, for he can be useful for future breeding. Are the Willie Lynch methods alive and well? Can anyone say George Floyd? The breaking process of the African woman. Take the female and run a series of tests on her to see if she will submit to your desires willingly. Test her in every way because she is the most important factor for good economics. If she shows any sign of resistance in submitting completely to your will, do not hesitate to use the bullwhip on her to extract that last bit of bitch out of her. Take care not to kill her, for in doing so you spoil good economics. When in complete submission, she will train her offsprings in the early years to submit to labor when they become of age. Understanding is the best thing. Therefore, 
we shall go deeper into this area of the subject matter concerning what we have produced here in this breaking process of the female nigger. We have reversed the relationship in her natural uncivilized state. She would have a strong dependency on the uncivilized nigger male, and she would have a limited protective tendency towards her independent male offspring and would raise male offsprings to be dependent like her. Nature had provided for this type of balance. We reversed nature by burning and pulling a civilized nigger apart and bullwhipping the other to the point of death, all in her presence. By her being left alone, unprotected, with the male image destroyed, the ordeal caused her to move from her psychological dependent state to a frozen, independent state. In this frozen psychological state of independence, she will raise her male and female offspring in reversed roles for fear of the young male's life. She will psychologically train him to be mentally weak and dependent and physically strong. Because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offspring to be psychologically independent. What have you got? You've got the nigger woman out front and the nigger man behind and scared. This is a perfect situation of sound sleep and economic. Before the breaking process, we had to be alertly on guard at all times. Now we can sleep soundly, for out of frozen fear, his woman stands guard for us. He cannot get past her early slave molding process. He is a good tool now. He's a good tool. Now ready to be tied to the horse at the tender age. By the time a nigger boy reaches the age of 16, He's soundly broken in and ready for a long life of sound and efficient work and the reproduction of a unit of good labor force. Continually through the breaking of uncivilized savage nigger by throwing the nigger female savage into a frozen psychological state of independence, by killing of the protective male image and by creating a submissive dependent mind of the nigger male slave, we have created an orbiting cycle that turns on its own axis forever unless a phenomenon occurs and reshifts the position of the male and female slaves. We show what we mean by example. Take the case of the two economic slave units and examine them closely. The Negro Marriage Unit We breed two nigger males with two nigger females. Then we take the nigger male away from them and keep them moving and working. Say one nigger female bears a nigger female and the other bears a nigger male. Both nigger females being without influence of the nigger male. Image, frozen with an independent psychology, will raise their offspring into reverse positions. The one with the female offspring will teach her to be like herself, independent and negotiable. We negotiate with her, through her, by her, negotiates her at will. The one with the nigger male offspring, she being frozen, subconscious, fear for his life, will raise him to be mentally dependent and weak, but physically strong. In other words, body over mind. Now in a few years, when these two offsprings become fertile for early reproduction, we will mate and breed them and continue the cycle. That is good, sound, and long-range comprehensive planning. Warning, possible interloping negatives. Earlier we talked about the non-economic good of the horse and the nigger in their wild or natural state. 
we talked out the principle of breaking and tying them together for orderly production. Furthermore, we talked about paying particular attention to the female, savage, and her offspring for orderly future planning. Then more recently, we stated that by reversing the positions of the male and female savages, we created an orbiting cycle that turns on its own axis forever unless a phenomenon occurred and recifit and positions of the male and female savages. I think that's a mistype there. Our expert warned us about the possibility of this phenomenon occurring, for they say that the mind has a strong drive to correct and recorrect itself over a period of time. If I can touch some substantial original historical base, they advise us that the best way to deal with the phenomenon is to shave off the brute's mental history and create multiplicity of phenomena, of illusions, so that each illusion will twirl in its own orbit something similar to floating balls in a vacuum. <laughs> Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I will read that again. They advised us that the best way to deal with the phenomenon is to shave off the brute's mental history and create a multiplicity of phenomena, of illusions, so that each illusion will twirl in its own orbit something similar to floating balls in a vacuum. And we believe that they would give us somebody to save our souls. We really believe that this Jesus character that they gave us is to help us get to heaven, is to save our souls. They gave us a language that condemns us daily. And they gave us an idol to worship. This creation of multiplicity, of phenomena, of illusions, entails the principle of crossbreeding the nigger and the horse, as we stated above the purpose of which is to create a diversified division of labor, thereby creating different levels of labor and different values of illusion at each connecting level of labor, the results of which is the severance of the points of original beginnings for each sphere illusion, since we feel that the subject matter may get more complicated as we proceed in laying down our economic plan concerning the purpose, reason, and effect of cross-breeding horses and nigger, we shall lay down the following definition, terms for future generations. Everything that they've given to us is an illusion. And we need to remember that. And whatever they tell us, Believe the opposite, because the opposite is the truth. Orbiting cycle means a thing turning in a given path. Axis means upon which or around which a body turns. Phenomenon means something beyond ordinary conception and inspires awe and wonder. Multiplicity means a great number. Share means a globe. Cross-breeding a horse means taking a horse and breeding it with an ass, and you get a dumb backward ass, long-headed mule, that is neither reproductive nor productive by itself. Cross-breeding niggers mean taking so many drops of good white blood 
and putting them into as many nigger women as possible varying drops by the various tones that you want and then letting them breed with each other until another circle of color appears as you desire what this means is this we put the niggers and the horses in a breeding pot mix some asses and some good white blood and what do you get devious you get a multiplicity of colors of ass, backward, unusual niggers running, tied to a backward ass, long-headed mule, the one productive of itself, the other sterile, the one constant, the other dying. We keep the nigger constant, for we may replace the mules for another tool, but mule and nigger tied to each other, neither knowing where the other came from, and neither productive for itself, nor without each other. Controlled language. Mm -hmm. Crossbreeding completed for further severance from their original beginning. We must completely annihilate the mother tongue. Of both the new nigger and the new mule and institute a new language that involves the new life work of both you know language is a peculiar institution it leads to the heart of a people the more a foreigner knows about the language of another country the more he is able to move through all levels of the society therefore if the foreigner is an enemy of the country to the extent that he knows the body of the language, to that extent is the country vulnerable to attack or invasion of a foreign culture. For example, if you take a slave, if you teach him all about your language, he will know all your secrets, and he is then no more a slave for you, for you can't fool him any longer. And being a fool is one of the basic ingredients of, of an incidence to the maintenance of the slavery system. For example, if you told a slave that he must perform in getting out our crops and he knows the language well, he would know that our crops didn't mean our crops. And the slavery system would break down, for he would relate on the basis of what our crop really meant. Do you see why they had to change our language? So you have to be careful in setting up the new language, for the slaves would soon be in your house, talking to you as man to man. Do you see why they had to change our language? Do you see why we need to speak our language? And that is death to our economic system. Let me read that again. To the maintenance of the slavery system, for example, if you told a slave that he must perform in getting out our crops, and he knows the language well, he would know that our crops didn't mean our crops crops and the slavery system would break down for he would relate on the basis of what our crops really meant so you have to be careful in setting up the new language for the slaves would soon be in your house talking to you as man to man and that is death to our economic system in addition the definition of words or terms are only a mute part of the process. Values are created and transported by communication through the body of the language. A total society has many interconnected value system. All the values in this society have bridges of language to connect them for orderly working in the society. But for these language bridges, 
these many value systems would sharply clash and cause internal strife or civil war. The degree of the conflict being determined by the magnitude of the issues or relative opposing strength in whatever form. For example, if you put a slave in a hog pen and train him to live there and incorporate in him to value it as a way of life completely, the biggest problem you would have out of him is that he would worry you about provisions to keep the hog pen clean or the same hog pen and make a slip and incorporate something in his language whereby he comes to value a house more than he does his hog pen, you got a problem. He will soon be in your house. That concludes the reading of The Making of a Slave by Willie Lynch. Well, it seems that we're in their house. We are in their house. And it's time for us to become the head and not the tail. If you've enjoyed your time with me, please like, subscribe, and share. And even if you haven't enjoyed your time with me, I hope, I hope that somebody has learned something about why the Melanated Society is the way that it is. It was a very deliberate and direct wicked act. And we need to practice self-love and we need to love our melanated brothers and sisters and we need to respect we need to respect our melanated brothers we need to respect our melanated sisters and we need to love each other somebody once sent me a picture and underneath the table were a bunch of melanated brothers holding up this table and on top were our oppressors playing a game I think it may have been chess and the caption was what would happen if they all stood up we need to stand up and say enough is enough we're not doing this anymore we're not doing this anymore we need to let our voices be heard i wish you baruch and shalom shabbat shabbatah